So I guess we can smoothly we can smoothly start. And so it's my pleasure to introduce you our today's speaker, Professor Michal Matuszewski, who comes from Institute of Physics from Polish Academy of Sciences. And so he'll talk today on efficient optical computing with excellent polaritons. So Professor Matuszewski, please, you're welcome. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, this prestigious seminar. Uh, I will be very happy to give uh, a talk to this audience. And today I want to talk about uh, optical computing with exciton polaritons. Uh, but uh, because this is quite a general audience of theoretical physicists, I will first make uh, quite a, a long introduction to the topic of optical computing. Uh, so I would like to uh, mention that uh, this uh, mm, the stock will, the results of the stock were done in uh, collaboration with several groups. In particular, I would like to uh, emphasize the role of my PhD student Andrzej Opala, who uh, did uh, all the mm, numerical work, uh, and uh, also mm, two experimental groups from the University of Warsaw and also from CNR Nanotech in Lecce as well as uh, the theoretical group of uh, Timothy Liu from Singapore. So I would like to start with a very brief introduction to neural networks. Uh, well, uh, mm, what is uh, machine learning? I think most of us know, but uh, for a reminder, um, we know that modern computers are very efficient in solving many problems, but some of these tasks, uh, the tasks are very hard to implement. For example, uh, up, uh, until recently, it was very difficult to actually, it is very difficult to write an algorithm, step-by-step -step algorithm that would recognize an object from uh, different viewpoints in different scenarios or lightning conditions. For example, like uh, detecting a cut on the photo. As in a similar way, it is difficult to detect a fraudulent uh, credit card transaction. And these uh, um, issues have uh, in common that to solve these problems, you need to combine a very large number of weak rules with complex dependencies, rather than follow some kind of simple and reliable rules as you do when you just write an algorithm. On the other hand, these tasks, these tasks are often very uh, easy for humans. For example, and none of us would have any problem uh, saying that there is a cut in each of those photos. So uh, we know that there's been a, a quite a big breakthrough uh, in recent years in uh, machine learning. And uh, some many of this uh, comes from the application of uh, deep learning, which is uh, learning with uh, neural networks um, with many hidden layers. Uh, so the idea of neural networks is the following, that instead of writing an algorithm that would perform a task, we provide a large number of exam examples that are used as an input for the algorithm that is teaching a neural network. Uh, an artificial neural network, uh, this simple artificial neural network can look like this, as in this uh, figure. So we have a number of layers. There is an input layer, output layer, and uh, some uh, number of hidden layers. And in the inputs, we basically give the information. So for example, the, we uh, give information about pixels of the photo. And we want uh, the neural network to perform a task, which, uh, for example, uh, consists of um, activating a neuron at the output, la neuron output layer, which corresponds to the detection of a cut. Uh, in the middle, there is a number of neurons which uh, typically perform operation uh, which consists of a summation of, uh, in form of activations from previous neurons multiplied by some weights. And these weights are uh, tuned during teaching. So the, algorithm, the um, purpose of algorithm is to tune these weights in such a way that this neural network will perform this task. Also, uh, neural networks require uh, nonlinear activation. So every time uh, we perform this uh, summation, then we want to uh, transform this output by applying some kind of nonlinear function. Uh, and what is important is that these uh, neural networks are able to uh, do the, the, the task that we want them to do, not only of the data that it 
uh, was used for teaching, but also on the data that it has never seen before. So the, there is a really a large uh, um, range of application of neural networks and deep learning uh, in practice. For example, every type, time we type in a Google search uh, in English, we actually ask a neural network to provide the answer. Um, neural networks uh, are also used for autonomous, uh, in autonomous vehicles, for speech recognition, uh, in fraud prevention, and also in medical diagnosis. So, but, but uh, I would like to um, focus on some limitations of this uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, actually, the existing machine al learning algorithms require uh, very large amounts of data, and also they consume uh, a large amount of uh, valuable resources to perform the teaching. For example, uh, the current language model of Google requires about 5,000 uh, hours of training, which is equivalent to more than 1,000 pounds of CO2 emission. And this is comparable to a single passenger trip from New York to San Francisco in terms of carbon footprint. And actually the situation is uh, getting worse. So this, these are some uh, predictions made in 2015 about the uh, percentage, of, percentage of electricity usage uh, for uh, communication technology, so it is com com communication and computing. And depending on the scenario, we can expect 20%, uh, even to 50% of uh, electricity, global electricity consumption coming from communication technology in 2030. And uh, this is related to the breakdown of Moore's law. So Moore's law, as we know, is uh, ex uh, some kind of phenomenological law which states that every two years, uh, the number of transistors per chip, chip and the performance of uh, electronic chips is increasing, uh, is doubling. Uh, however, even if the number of transistors per chip is, uh, um, is still increasing, we see a clear plateau in the performance. So if we look at the uh, clock speed of uh, transistors, it, at some point in time, it has practically stalled. And this is uh, related to the breakdown of uh, Denard scaling, which is again a phenomenological law that states that the, as the density of transistor per millimeter squared increases, the power consumption as per millimeter squared stays the same. And this is related to the properties, physical properties of uh, silicon. And this scaling uh, allows to uh, deploy uh, new generations of uh, processors and uh, chips which were ever more powerful and we were performing practically more and more operations for the same cost. However, at some point in 2006, this uh, 2007, this uh, scaling uh, started to slow down and by 2012 it practically had dropped to zero. So, uh, the answer to this, what we can do for, with this is uh, one of the possible answers is uh, the development of neuromorphic computing. So uh, what is neuromorphic computing? Well, we know that uh, neural networks that we use, that we uh, employ in our computers are based on computer simulations. So it means that the network structure only exists virtually in computer memory. On the other hand, in neuromorphic systems, the structure of the network is resembled in some way in hardware, which brings benefits in terms of operational efficiency. So the problem with uh, computer simulations is that if we use the traditional von Neumann computer architecture, which uh, basically looks like this, that we have a central a processing unit which is connected with the memory with, by a bus which allows for transfer of information then if we want to uh, perform simulation of neural network there will be a huge load on the transfer of data between memory and cpu and this uh, this so-called von neumann bottleneck leads to the uh, decrease of efficiency or some kind of saturation of efficiency 
The answer to this is to development of neuromorphic computing and uh, first prototypes of such system already exist. For example, what, one of the first chips was the TrueNorf chip from IBM, which contained 1 million neurons, uh, more than 200 million synapses, and its structure looked like this. So instead of a central processing unit and memory that are completely separate, uh, there was uh, a grid of uh, computing units, each of them consisting of both neurons, so processing unit, and synapses, so memory units which were connected by uh, synchronous and asynchronous communication. Uh, such a design allowed to uh, perform machine learning tasks uh, with power consum consumption even 100 times lower than typical CPU. Uh, such systems are developed also by other companies as well as many universities, and there is a number of uh, international products that for development of such uh, systems. So, but in these talks, I would like to uh, consider whether we can use, uh, take advantage of photons in some way to perform efficient computing. So in, in some memory, what is the difference between electrons and photons in, from the point of view of such applications? Well, electrons are excellent for information processing. Photons, on the other hand, uh, are excellent for communication of information. As we know, we use uh, photonic links for communication on uh, long distances. However, electrons um, are characterized by substantial interactions, whereas photons interact only very weakly and only in nonlinear media, media. So this is a problem from the point of view of computation, because if you want to perform computation to create a transistor or a nonlinear uh, fu activation function of a neuron, we will need some kind of uh, nonlinearity. On the other hand, uh, photons are characterized by low losses. So if we want to uh, create energy efficient uh, devices, we might look into photons. Okay, so uh, using photons for computation is not a new, new idea. And actually this idea was developed as early as in the 70s, where uh, in uh, this uh, experiment by Goodman and others, it was demonstrated that photons propagation of light in free space can be used for performing vector matrix multiplication in a straightforward way due to the properties of Maxwell equations. So this device uh, was based on such a concept. We have a number of sources which represent the input to the vector input for the multiplication. And we have a memory mask which represents the matrix that we want to multiply this vector uh, mm, we want to uh, multiply this vector by. And on the other side, there is a number of photodetectors that detect the intensity of the of light. By using a certain uh, quite simple scheme of um, lenses, it is possible to construct a system, optical system, that will realize this multiplication just by uh, propagation of light. And it is important to note that vector matrix multiplication is one of the most important operations of, for neural network implementations in, and in general in big data um, uh, applications. It was also demonstrated that it is possible to use holographic techniques to actually encode much uh, denser information than just in a memory mask and perform similar operations. So these early prototypes of neural network uh, networks displayed a wide range of functionality, but they actually never found any applications. And this, is, this was due to several factors. One of the factors were the rapid development of electronics, uh, thanks to the more slow. Another was universality, universality of uh, electronics uh, in contrast to uh, photonic devices, which were able also only to perform application-specific operations. Another factor is the impracticality of, electro of uh, optics, which requires bulky elements, uh, whereas uh, electronics can be easily integrated. And another thing is that apart from communication, a practical advantage of photonics in speed or energy efficiency has never been demonstrated. So, However, uh Michal, sorry for interrupting. I would like to ask a question at this point. Sure. So uh, probably you know these papers by Derenguetta, 
so they mm -hmm. when they suggested like using meta surfaces for performing some operations like integration differentiation mm -hmm. uh, so uh, i wonder whether this solves at least some of the problems you mentioned here let's say this removes the need of bulky elements uh, at least yes, yes. Mm -hmm. but maybe there are some drawbacks so could you comment on that so i would say that uh... I also want to show in the next slide that nowadays uh, there is a number of uh, photonic uh, experiments in photonics that, uh, for example, implement uh, optical operations in, uh, in integrated devices. So I think what you uh, mentioned is one of examples of such a device that implements specific uh, operation in an integrated device. So it actually uh, answers to one of these drawbacks. So, uh, but in, the, in this talk, I would like to focus on uh, neural networks because this is uh, one of the main, uh, let's say, one of the main contributors to this energy efficiency problems uh, globally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as I said, nowadays the situation is quite different because uh, on the on one hand, the Moore's law for electronics is no longer valid. Uh, there is a growing need for application-specific devices in electronics, uh, such as GPUs, TPUs that perform, for example, this vector matrix multiplication. Photonics can be now integrated on a chip. And the advantage of pot photonics in, te in terms of uh, speed and er energy efficiency uh, is likely to be demonstrated in, in practical devices in the near future. So I would like to show some uh, examples of uh, optical implementations of integrated uh, optical uh, neural networks. So one of them is uh, the so-called broadcast and weight uh, um, uh, device, which is implementation based on integrated optics, uh, including uh, res ring resonators that apply weights to the optical signal, a phot photodiode, balanced photodiode, which applies uh, weighting, uh, and uh, conversion of, of optical signal to electronics, and a laser neuron, which provides this nonlinear activation function and uh, transforms electronic signal to, to an optical signal. Another device, very interesting device, is uh, mm, this one proposed by <coughs> in the group of Marin Soljacic and others, which consists of syst a system of Maxander interferometers that can realize an arbitrary uh, operation, taking linear operation, taking advantage of the fact that uh, any op linear operation can be decomposed into two unitary operations, changing, changing the basis, and a diagonal operation, which only attenuates a uh, signal by uh, non-zero elements on the diagonal. So, this can perform any linear operation, and finally, there can be an optical nonlinearity unit which provides nonlinearity. Such a device was uh, used for to performing uh, for performing uh, um, spoken vowel recognition. Uh, another interesting device is based not on integrated, uh, really, but on free space optics, but using a certain number of diffractive layers. So here. Uh, as in the first experiment from the 70s, light is propagating in free space and it comes from through a number of layers which are patterned in such a way that the light propagating actually performs an um, operation which is analogous to a neural network operation. So we can um, just use a sample, <coughs> a pattern light as a sample at the input of the network and then at the output of the network detector will uh, be the detector corresponding to this uh, digit that is provided at the input will be activated. Uh, another uh, um, whole family of uh, experiments is based on so-called reservoir computing. Uh, I will mention uh, more about reservoir computing in, in uh, some time. So here, instead of uh, designing a special uh, system for uh, implementation of particular tasks, we have a set of interconnected neurons which are often interconnected randomly, but they can still provide some kind of uh, transformation of, of input in such a way that 
uh, it is used for uh, can be used for uh, detecting um, machine learning and this concept is actually uh, inspired by the structure of a human brain and it was used to perform for example uh, recognition of human action so uh, these are really good uh, recent reviews that summarize actually uh, recent advances in optical neural networks as well as historical perspective so if anyone wants to uh, gain more knowledge in this interesting field i uh, recommend uh, looking at this at, at them okay so now i would like to move to polariton neural networks so why do we need polaritons well i was mentioning that photons have the disadvantage that that they interact very quickly and only in nonlinear media. So that's why usually we work, when there are uh, devices that are based on photons, they need really strong uh, optical um, beams or optical passes to perform certain operations. So actually the energy cost of some such operations is larger than in the case of electronics. So even though the losses are smaller, we still need very strong uh, uh, light beams to perform the operation. So the question is, can we have substantial interactions such as an electrons and low communication losses at the same time? Can we have the advantages of both systems? And the answer is that we could have using exactly exciton polaritons because exciton polaritons are quasi particles which are hybrid quantum particles resulting from a quantum coupling of excitons, so matter interactions, and photons, so particles of light. And so exciton polaritons typically appear in microcavities where light is trapped on a micrometer spatial scale, and excitons are tra trapped in uh, quantum wells. So this is a semiconductor device. And when this coupling between matter and light is stronger than the effects of decoherence related to losses in the system, then the correct quantum uh, description of the system is in terms of quasi-particles called exciton polaritons. And these particles have both uh, ex uh, excellent transport properties and strong interactions thanks to the photonic and exciton component. The proper description of polaritons uh, the simplest proper description in, in terms of such a Hamiltonian, which includes excitonic uh, component, uh, where A is a, um, a bosonic operator describing excitons, a photonic component, where again we have a bosonic operator, and quantum coupling between them, which has the form of a creation of an exciton and annihilation of a photon, or vice versa. This Hamiltonian can be easily uh, diagonalized and we can find uh, mixed states of excitons and photons. And now if we plot the dispersion of uh, excitons and photons, it turns out that due to this anti crossing of uh, these two branches, uh, we have uh, two new branches, lower polaritons and upper polaritons. And in this reg region of anti crossing, these particles are hybridized excitons and photons. Note that here the photon has an unusual, unusual parabolic dispersion due to the confinement in the cavity. So in the cavity, in function of the transverse momentum, photons are actually they, uh, have a mass. Uh, so there is a number of applications of exciton polaritons, and uh, I would not like to discuss all of them, but they are used for simulation of a number of uh, systems realization of uh, lasers, including topological lasers, and uh, uh, mm, like uh, switches and uh, transistors for, mm, for processing of information. And now we propose that they can also be used for neural networks. So our first proposal was based on this concept of reservoir computing. So what is reservoir computing? It assumes that we have a number of nodes which are connected with each other, but these connections don't have to be uh, made in any specific way. This can be, for example, for random connections. Uh, and these connections are not tuned in any way during teaching of the system. Uh, we have input that is connected to these nodes, of, also often in a random way, and we have output layer. And this output layer is the only 
a part of the system that is modified during teaching. So you can ask, why do we need all these uh, random static connections? Well, the reason is that if uh, this uh, reservoir consists of nodes that are nonlinear, then it effectively performs a nonlinear transformation of the input into a multidimensional, uh, high dimensional space. So the number of nodes usually is much larger than the number of inputs. And this allows to extract useful information in this output layer much more efficiently than if this reservoir was absent. This might seem counterintuitive, but it really works very well in many uh, tasks. So maybe I will ask if there's any questions at this point. So I do not see raised hands, so I guess uh, not so far. Maybe I have a couple of small questions, but I will ask maybe at the end when there will okay. be a discussion. Okay. Okay, so uh, this reservoir computing uh, paradigm was used in many, many physical systems. It is easy to implement in many systems because you don't need a system that is tunable. You can uh, have a system that is completely random and controllable. The only requirement is to be highly interconnected, have many degrees of freedom and to be nonlinear. So it's very general. Okay, so our idea was to implement this idea in exciton polaritons. And uh, the system that we have in mind is a set of microcavity polariton micropillars. So here you have polariton lattice, where actually here each of these uh, pillars uh, is, is a microcavity. So there, are, there is a mirror on each side of the micropillar, and there is a quantum well inside. And this quantum well hosts excitons. Uh, because of this, uh, this uh, trapping of light and excitons, there is a strong coupling in each of these pillars, but at the same time, there is po a possibility of two tunneling of polaritons between the pillars. So we can, uh, in the simplest uh, possible way, and but quite accurate way, we can describe the system using this discrete complex ginzburg landau equation. This uh, equation includes injection of information from outside, which can be realized by an external laser, coupling between the pillars, as well as, as, well as losses, both linear losses and nonlinear losses, and interactions in the system. So these interactions is exactly the nonlinearity which comes from this interaction of excitons, uh, which uh, are part of polaritons. So our proposal was the following. Let's say that we consider this uh, task of uh, recognition of handwritten digits, such as digit zero here. We uh, transform this digit into a time-dependent signal. We multiply this uh, signal by a random matrix just to, this matrix is random, but it is like fixed during the whole experiment. Uh, this is just to distribute this information, time-dependent information, uh, across the system, across the lattice. This lattice contains a large number of polariton nodes. We, uh, there is some kind of dynamics appearing in the system, and we are monitoring the activation, so the intensity emitted from the pillars. Then we use uh, this output layer to, uh, and we actually use software here at this step to perform linear classification uh, to perform this operation of the output layer, which is needed for teaching the network. And in the end, we, uh, we get a result. So the system should uh, activate a particular neuron at the output layer, depending on the digit that has been provided. So, and this is so, an example. Yes, Michael, sorry for interrupting. Regarding the previous slide. So I wonder whether the result of teaching depends somehow on the size of the system. So, uh, does it change, uh, let's say, the number of steps uh, when, when you increase the system size? Yes, yes, uh, it does depend. So basically, in this concept of reservoir computing, your reservoir has to be quite large because, because uh, these new nodes are not tunable. So you need more nodes than in usual network uh, to perform the same task with the same accuracy. So we need quite a large, uh, quite a large reservoir, and depending on the size, you will have 
like your accuracy of predictions would be better or worse. And then you measure this accuracy in terms of this N. So you uh, on the left hand side, you have these N signals. So the larger the system, the larger N somehow. Is it? Exactly, exactly. The larger the accuracy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will actually show a, a figure showing this in a moment. So uh, I just want to show the, how this uh, data set looks like. This is a set of 110 digits, and the task is to recognize this digit. And uh, our network was able to do this up to 95% accuracy. <coughs> uh, and actually, the best uh, result we obtained when this uh, network was at the edge of a phase transition. So I didn't mention it before, but actually in this system, described in, by this uh, ginsburg Landau equation, there is a transition from a state which has almost no polaritons to a state which has, uh, in which there is uh, condensation or lacing. So uh, it is, um, depending on the context, it is called Bose-Einstein condensation when this is a, a system of condensed. Uh, um, you are describing a, a system which undergoes Bose-Einstein condensation or lasing if you are describing just a laser. So for polaritons, we can observe both both the Einstein condensation and lasing depending on the uh, conditions of the experiment. But I don't want to go into details on that. Just want to say that, that generally in this reservoir computing, you usually get the best results when you are on kind of uh, edge of stability or kind of phase transition. And this is also so what maybe I ask here. this uh, question about the phase transition. So is it somehow related to the fact that the derivatives of ther thermodynamic quantities they have this jump uh, during the tra phase transition? So some uh, response coefficients are maximized, uh, I would say. Yes. So is it somehow related? Yes, so uh, in principle, yes. So uh, in Bose-Einstein condensation, this is a continuous phase transition where you have, uh, for example, critical slowing down. And so the time response time is uh, uh, diverging at the phase transition and uh, so on and so on. But uh, mm, this would be oversimplification because uh, actually for polaritons, this is a highly non-equilibrium system. So the system is not always in thermal equilibrium. And then uh, the description using thermodynamic variables is not always valid. So um, mm, then uh, the, this theory of phase transitions uh, is not really applicable. So uh, one should be careful about uh, saying that there is a thermodynamic phase transition here. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have a finite response, by the way. So you have this finite uh, on, on this graph. So if we go further, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so it's kind of smooth transition. It's not like sharp, uh, sharp yeah. peak. And mm -hmm. this is, yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Uh, so, uh, okay, actually, I don't have this graph of the number, but if the size of the reservoir is uh, increasing, actually, we get this 95% accuracy at the very, very large limit of very, very large uh, lattice. Okay, but what I want to mention is that uh, we may, because of this high nonlinearity of polaritons and very short time scales on the level of picoseconds, uh, we predicted that this system can be quite uh, efficient. So, for example, in this task of uh, spoken word recognition, uh, we found that our system in principle could be able to perform these tasks uh, orders of magnitude faster than uh, others in other systems uh, considered so far. Of course, this is only a theoretical result, so um, one should be careful, but uh, Okay, so now I would like to uh, talk about experiments that uh, we performed with uh, our colleagues. So the first experiment was uh, more or less based on the concept that I showed before, but uh, instead of encoding the signal in time, it was encoded in space using a spatial light modulator. So spatial light modulator probably you know, but it is a device which allows you to write uh, arbitrary, practically arbitrary, phase or amplitude uh, pattern on, on the incoming pulse. 
So it, the information was encoded in such a way in the uh, in both phase and amplitude, and we we use this microcavity sample to perform nonlinear transformation. So the transmission in function of incoming power uh, had a very strongly nonlinear dependence. Then this output from the sample was monitored by a camera, and it was used to perform uh, this output layer. Uh, again in software. Uh, so we found that our system was able to uh, achieve a quite high 93% accuracy, which is significantly higher than the um, threshold of linear, uh, linear classification. So it means that this reservoir that we have, this polariton reservoir, it really contributed by non this nonlinear transformation into high dimensional space, it really contributed to increasing the accuracy of the system. Uh, and moreover, we found that um, not only the accuracy was quite high, but compared to other uh, physical implementations, our system is in, in principle able to operate at very short time scales. So we can expect that uh, polariton systems can operate even at the terahertz range because the natural time scales for polaritons are in the picosecond range. Uh, okay, so another experiment that we uh, realized uh, in Warsaw was based in so-called so binarized networks. So binarized neural networks are networks in which the activations or weights of connections are two level and the neurons perform simple binary operations. What is important that these networks are characterized by great, greatly improved speed and energy efficiency at the cost of minimal reduction of accuracy. And it was shown in this, in this works. So we used this concept and built a um, building block of a binary network is actually a neuron which performs a simple exclusive OR operation. Uh, why exclusive OR and not another operation? Because exclusive OR is an operation that cannot be performed efficiently by a linear system. So if you are able, are able to perform this operation, it means that your system is, uh, let's say, strongly nonlinear from the point of view of computation. So it can be seen in a simple way on this graph. So if you have exclusive OR operation and your uh, plot results in function of input, so inputs can be zero or one, you basically have to distinguish these orange uh, circles from blue circles. And you can see that you cannot draw any straight line that will perform this uh, division between those cases. So it means that using a linear system, you will only uh, reach up to 75% of accuracy. However, if you have a nonlinear feature, so you transform your, <coughs> sorry, your signal in such a way that you have an additional variable, nonlinear variable, which depends on x and y in a nonlinear way, then if your variable is nonlinear enough, you may be able to draw a plane which separates those two cases uh, with 100% accuracy. And this is what we uh, achieved with those polaritons uh, sample. So we designed and constructed a binary neural network where neurons were realized as polar, polariton exclusive OR gates. Uh, this was, uh, the reason to do this was also uh, ease of implementation. So it is actually much easier to implement uh, such a gate than a neural, net, neural uh, neuron which will perform, for example, a relu function. Uh, so what we did, we uh, used two uh, laser pulses, which were incident on a sample. And we monitored basically the output, the transmission through the sample. And it turned out that the transmission is strongly nonlinear and actually in some way resembles the ReLU function. The ReLU function is a function which is uh, flat at the beginning, but then it increases uh, linearly uh, after crossing some threshold. Uh, and we found that uh, because of this nonlinear dependence, we are able to uh, mm, to perform this uh, classification to 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 perform this uh, exclusive or operation with a hundred percent accuracy. And what is important is that this nonlinear transformation was realized entirely with optical elements. So we had linear classification 
later in performed in software, but it was only performing a linear operation. Uh, and thanks to that, we were able to construct a network using time multiplexing. So we, it means that we use the same neuron over and over again to perform classification of uh, uh, digits, hundred and digits from this um, NIST database with a 96% accuracy, which is comparable to other state-of-the-art uh, neuromorphic hardware realizations. Okay, so uh, apart from that, we considered whether we can replace all these electronic elements and uh, replace them by uh, optical elements. So we constructed a, a exclusive OR gate, which again performed uh, with 100% accuracy, but now this weighting was performed optically. So we used beam splitters to uh, apply additional weights uh, in this uh, X and Y dimension. Uh, to realize uh, by, which were realized by direct connections of light between the source and, and the detector. Uh, in this way, we achieved energy efficiency of about 16 picojoule per synaptic operation. This was done all optically. And this efficiency is actually uh, very close uh, to the limits of electronics already. Okay, so uh, finally, I would like to uh, say about the outlook of this polariton neural networks and why we think they are interesting and promising for these applications. Um, well, consider a nonlinear phase acquired by an optical pulse, which is going through a microcavity containing exciton polaritons. Uh, let's assume that this pulse, after uh, going through the cavity, is more or less the same, but it acquires some kind of nonlinear phase. And this phase is proportional to the energy of the pulse. And now, if we are able to achieve a pi phase shift by transmission through a cavity, that it means that we can perform a useful operation. Because then we can, for example, use this phase shift, use a Max Zender interferometer to completely block the transmission of the pulse <coughs> or make it pass through, depending on this pi phase shift. Uh, so, uh, if you if we look at the equation, it corresponds approximately to the condition that the nonlinear energy is higher than the uh, lifetime of polaritons in the nonlinear uh, cavity. If we do the calculation, we found that this energy cost is about four orders of magnitude lower for polaritons than for any other nonlinear optical media. So it is really really strong nonlinearity. And using that, we propose a, an all optical neural network design. So here we have an input, which is encoded in space by a series of pulses. These pulses arrive at the microcavity simultaneously and form an array of nodes. Then the output from these nodes are split into M copies, where M is the number of classes that we want to, to uh, distinguish. Uh, we have a weight bank, which is applying uh, attenuating light corresponding to certain spots uh, on these uh, copies of outputs. And then we focus on all this uh, on the detectors. And now this, should, uh, this system should perform complete operation of neural networks in the optical domain. There are no electronics elements in this network, except for, of course, for light modulators, which have to encode. So we have to have some kind of interface between electronics, which contains the data, to optics. We also have detectors, we have to, which have to convert uh, optical signal to electronics. But this costs, uh, even though it's uh, usually on the picojoule uh, energy scale, at, uh, at least, uh, we have to underline that the number of inputs and the number of classes, so the number of detectors and the number of input modulators, is usually much lower than the number of neurons in the neural networks. So we can take advantage of this to decrease the average cost of operation per neuron. What is also important is that the optical ways that we are applying here can be implemented by a standard system that has been implemented many, many times before, by a, in a liquid crystal array or a phase change material, and these weights do not have to be tuned during inference. So after teaching, when we want to, we already, system is already, uh, um, or has already learned how to recognize uh, the samples, 
We don't have to tune anything. We just provide samples. We can provide hundreds or thousands of samples without any changing of the weights, which is important from the point of view of uh, energy efficiency. So we uh, try to estimate the um, possible efficiency of the system, taking into account the energy cost both of the light source, modulators, detectors, and optical losses. And we found that depending on the parameters that we use, so we consider both the idealized case where we have a large curve system and parameters corresponding to state-of-the-art optical elements, and a proof of principle system which has, a, um, let's say, just 100 nodes and is, has very uh, accessible optical elements which can be basically bought uh, off the shelf. And we found that in both of these cases, orders of magnitude improvements over electronics uh, in energy efficiency and processing split per millimeter squared could be in principle achieved. Okay, so in summary, I would like to, uh, I uh, try to uh, show that uh, um, Exciton Polaritons are promise, a promising platform for machine learning with photons, thanks to their uh, like hybrid nature of between electrons and photons. And our estimates indicate that orders of magnitude improvements over electronics in terms of speed energy, energy efficiency can be in principle achieved. So with this, thank you for your attention and uh, I'm waiting for questions. Thanks, Michal. Very nice talk. So now uh, uh, the talk is open for questions. So I would ask the first one. Uh, you demonstrated these nice functionalities of uh, Polariton platform. So I wonder about temperatures. Uh, so do you have to maintain some, some low temperatures, millikelvin or some kind of that? Because you mentioned that the maximum of sensitivity is reached at phase transition. So it's... Yeah, oh, okay. Yes, this is a very good question. So. Uh, actually, uh, so there are um, polariton systems which uh, work at room temperature. In our experiments, we used polaritons in gallium arsenide, which require, uh, let's say, liquid helium temperature. Mm -hmm. But there is a number, there is a number of uh, materials already demonstrated in the laboratory where polaritons were created in uh, at room temperature, including organics, perovskites, uh, mm, two-dimensional materials. Uh, uh, zinc oxide and so on. So that it should be possible. And now as uh, this phase transition um, in, this, uh, in this equation goes. So actually this phase transition is not, uh, in, in the case of polaritons, it is usually not in the function of temperature. So for example, we can have a system which works entirely in, at room temperature. And this phase transition is achieved by increasing the density of polaritons. So it is a different kind of knob that we tune. So by increasing the pumping uh, laser intensity, we go through to a phase transition, for example, to lasing. So it doesn't mean that we need to uh, maintain a low temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. And so then you also, also mentioned that uh, with regard to speech recognition, uh, these polariton structures can, can operate orders of magnitude faster than electronics. So is it like a general feature related to the fact that you're exploiting uh, higher frequencies, uh, optical uh, signals instead of electronics, and this gives you the whole advantage, or there are some other factors? Okay, so I would say like that, that generally it is known that uh, optics in principle can give you a very high frequency. and. Yes. Even in the case of uh, optical waveguides, if you have very high data rates, you need to use optical links because at some point electronics because becomes very, very in inefficient. The losses are very high. Mm -hmm. So this is one thing. But on the other hand, if we want to uh, <coughs> perform some kind of complicated operations using photons, then we need to have some kind of non-linearity because just by linear operation, well, you can do some operation, but like simple ones. If you want to achieve very high accuracy, you need non-linearity. And most of the uh, non-linear optical materials have very low non-linearity and polaritons have very high non-linearity. So this is why we can have both high frequency, so uh, high uh, data rate, but at the same time, high energy efficiency. 
because if we wanted to use a material that has low nonlinearity, our energy of our pulses that encode interaction information uh, would have to be very, very high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, this seems reasonable. And then a question regarding the introductory part of your talk. So you mentioned several applications of neural networks, and as far as I know, people are trying to apply them nowadays for solving some problems. Let's say yes. uh, you teach a neural network on some set of examples, and then you, you ask it to, to solve some problem. Uh, probably you do not know even the solution. Uh, so you somehow extrapolate the experience which the neural network uh, get. So what do you think on this application? Is it, uh, is it perspective somehow? Or it's, uh, so it's always, how can you trust the solution you cannot check? Okay. So, uh, um, okay, I'm not sure if you, uh, I understand your question well, um, because there is a problem with neural networks that you can uh, teach the neural network. I mean, you use algorithm to teach it, but you don't know how, what kind of, how it thinks. Like, uh, you cannot look into the neural network and see and gain knowledge uh, how, let's say, if, if this neural network have uh, some kind of excellent idea about something you still cannot understand why uh, it will not tell you why uh, what was the reason so uh, it is a disadvantage of neural networks definitely and that's why it is um, it will probably not uh, replace completely like uh, um, standard way of doing research for, so for example uh, but I'm actually not an expert in neural networks uh, algorithms. I'm kind of uh, more coming from the side of uh, material and uh, application of optics. So I, I'm not really involved in discussion so so much. But th this is my like personal view on this on this issue. Yeah, thank you, Michal. So I do not see other questions in the chat, and so with the hope that neural networks will not replace us us in the nearest future. Let me announce the next seminar, which will be held in a week. So we have uh, a speaker, Lyubov Kotova from St. Petersburg, Yoffe Institute. And so it, she will tell us about malignant selenite flake as a one of us uh, homo structure, luminescence properties and optical anisotropy. It's more like experimental work. So stay with us and see you next week. Thanks, Michal, once again. And thanks everyone Thank for, for coming. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye.